Hello, Kryptonauts, and welcome back to another episode of Cryptocurrency Chat. I am your host, Blockchain John, with my co-host, Jake Jabrelli, to give you the top 10 daily stats and your crypto news of the day. With that said, let's go ahead and switch over here and have Jake give us the top 10 daily stats. Go ahead, Jake. Thank you, John. So, uh, as per the usual, Bitcoin always on top, almost, almost almost always 50% of the entire market, although at the moment it's only about 40%. It's $47,558.11, a seven-day gain of 3.3%, market cap of nearly $9 billion. You can see there, those of you who are watching out to the right, it looks like a giant dragon with his head sticking out. So there's Ethereum. Ethereum in number two, 35 $54.91. A seven-day gain of 1.7% and a market cap of 417 billion. Still, roughly half that of Bitcoin. And so I think like market dominance is about 18.5%. Cardano ADA at $2.45 in third place, with a slight drop, 1.2% over the last seven days, and a market cap of 78 billion. Tether, which of course is a stable coin, so it doesn't fluctuate very much, is I'm not going to bother with the seven-day because it really isn't much uh, but the market cap is very close to but it currently sitting at 69 billion finance coin BNB, 425 dollars number fifth place is roughly three percent gain 2.7 percent actually at a market cap of 65.6 billion dollars xrp otherwise known as ripple is at dollar 10 with a slight loss over the seven days 0.4 percent at 51 billion market cap Solana, which we've all been watching very, with very bated breath, has lost almost 20% in the last seven days. It's, it's a curve there on the right, if you're watching, is pretty dismal. But it has moved up a lot. Its current price in slot number seven is $154.52, with a market cap of $46.5 billion. In position eight, Polkadot, $35.49, with a huge, 30, almost 30% seven-day gain of 28.9 and a market cap of 36.4 billion. Dogecoin, which has been slowly sliding down the scale, is back in position nine at 24.2 cents, a 5.4% loss over the last seven days and a $31.7 billion market cap. And then 10th place as of right now, which it has held for quite some time. USD coin, yet another stable coin, is down a tiny amount, but that's due to high trading. Uh, it would normally be a dollar, it's at 0.998, a 0.2% seven day loss, uh, at $29.1 billion. The total market cap as of right now is $2.241 trillion, up 1.5%. And the uh, make sure everyone check. I personally don't have it logged in, so let's look at John's candies. How's John been doing with his candies? Oh, he's on his second day. So almost to ten thousand there, John. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know. Nice. You, you don't have anything to spend it on yet? Uh, so there's so nothing. To spend it on. So the, here's here's the thing about Coin Gecko. When Coin Gecko first came out, they really got people hooked. That's why I got hooked initially, because they were literally giving uh, NFTs. Like just if you want a unique NFT, they're they're giving a batch of a, uh, of like ten thousand. Awesome, that's ten thousand rare NFTs. Now what they're doing is because there's so many people collecting candy, so many uh, users. Now obviously they can't just mint ten thousand. What they're doing is now you gotta be you gotta participate in this NFT giveaway. That's the catch, and you gotta gamble your two hundred candies. And I don't want to do that. I want, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers hoping that something is going to pop up here in the future that I can save up my my, my candies and, and buy something worthwhile. But for the time being, I don't really see... I, there's a lot of stuff on here. If this is your, if this is your type of stuff, uh, I don't really see anything for me personally. Let's see here. Crypto Cloaks, Keystone. Um, see, this... Here, look at that. Swag, no, swag pack. Swag pack. I, like. I got one of those early on. You did? Mm hmm. Oh, nice. Cool. And then, look at that. Fully redeemed. Q1 2021. Zero candies. You just had to click on it. Yeah, I was 
collecting it every single day just like I was supposed to and managed to get up to like 500 candies and then uh, they just happened to drop a swag bag and I was like, yep, that's mine. Nice. Nice. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So it's the gargantuan amount of news we have. Yeah, lots of news, man. Lots of news. Absolutely. Let's go with El Salvador. Matthew DeSalva wrote, Anti-Bitcoin protests escalate on El Salvador Independence Day. Bum, bum, bum. Protests in El Salvador escalated Wednesday on the country's Independence Day, with local press reporting citizens' fury at the country's new Bitcoin law. Protesters set fire to the, a Bitcoin ATM in the capital of San Salvador. Some took to the streets holding placards that read, We don't want Bitcoin and no to dictatorship. El Salvador on September 7th made Bitcoin legal tender in the country. It is the first country to do so. The country's president, Naib Bukele, I'll go with that, slammed citizens on Twitter who did not stop vandalism. He also lashed out at the press. You know what's crazy is that we got world leaders on Twitter. Uh, Twitter. I mean, that's... I know. I know. Uh, Trump was like who's that. that, that president? Yeah. That president, right? That's the last run president of this country. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Uh, who would have thought that Twitter is the is the form of communication? There have been protests against the move, the brainchild of President Bukele, since July and August. But today, yes. the protest the protests were by far the fiercest, with thousands of citizens take, uh, taken to the streets, according to local media. Uh, Salvadorians are not just protesting against the Bitcoin law, but also against President Bukele, who some believe has weakened the country's court, courts and consolidated too much power. Though Bukele previously fared well in opinion polls for improving uh, security in the tiny Central American country, he has come in for criticism lately over perceived uh, authoritarianism. Author, authoritarianism, is that right? Authorit authoritarianism. Yes. Authoritarianism. The Bitcoin law announced by Bukele in June and adopted by legislators shortly thereafter means that businesses have to accept payment in Bitcoin if they have the technology. Citizens are not required to use the asset but are encouraged to do so. Those who sign up to use the government's official crypto wallet, Chivo, are rewarded $30 in Bitcoin. Chivo has a technical issue since Bitcoin became legal tender in the country. Chivo. Chivo is, um, is goat. Huh. Investment banks such as... I wonder why they did that. Chivo. Oh, why did they name it Chivo? Uh, investment banks such as JP Morgan, U.S. officials, and even the world banks have criticized El Salvador's Bitcoin law, claiming it would be hard to implement today's protest. Are evidence that they might be right? What's, what's the big deal? Explain to me, please. Jake. What, what, what's going on that I don't understand? I thought Bitcoin would be their their freedom. Their savior? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, well, I'll put this this way. Governments are supposed to be afraid of their people, not the other way around. And governments are supposed to serve the people, and that's not what's happening. Um, the one thing that I would, I'm certain that the people of this country were not expecting was that the government was just like, oh, all of a sudden, yeah, that, that's just how it is. This is a new rule, and you have to follow it. And some people probably weren't super thrilled by it. They were probably pretty just just happy with the way Bitcoin already existed. Now, it's nice to see the country embrace Bitcoin, but to tie it to their own, you know, currency seems a little strange. Hmm. For me, it does. I mean, I, I don't see the U.S. ever doing that. We always already already have USD Tether. We don't really need it. Different, you know, Bitcoin being tied to the U.S. dollar, but um, all right, take on, take us on to the next one. All righty, so that would be the Ethereum DAOs, right? Ethereum, Ethereum DAOs can combat global misinformation. Gitcoin founder, Bitcoin founder Kevin Owaki wasn't even supposed to be on stage at MetaCartel's MCON 2021 conference day. However, when a scheduled panelist didn't show up, Milwaukee filled that void with quotable insights about Ethereum-based coordination and what he sees as the power and promise of decentralized autonomous organizations, otherwise known as DAOs. But, quote, first question, hardball, is it 
all coordination, end quote, Iwaki asked his counterpart, Metaverse engineer Meta Dreamer. It's all coordination, and it always has been, Meta Dreamer replied, to a smattering of applause from an in person crowd in Denver. Iwaki and Meta Dreamer went on to discuss the power of community coordination, including the potential for immutable blockchain networks to fight global threats like misinformation. Not a person, but information that's incorrect, otherwise known as fake news. The discussion happened amidst the backdrop of Incom, an event held by DAO or DAO Meta Cartel that is broadly op uh, about DAOs, or, you know, as we said before, decentralized autonomous organizations and features an array of speakers that participate in these various events. What's a DAO? Okay, well, it's, a, as we said before, decentralized organization powered by blockchain-driven smart contracts, or it's a code that performs set instructions. And DAOs can bring together people from all over the world with a shared vision or goal. They often rely on token-based governance votes and require ownership of certain tokens to participate. DAOs aren't a new thing. Think back to the DAO from 2016, but their use and potential application are growing rapidly of late. There are investment DAOs, NFT DAOs, and DAOs that govern decentralized finance, otherwise known as DeFi protocols. Even Decrypt is launching a DAO as we explore their potential to reshape media in an increasingly decentralized world. Hmm. DAO advocates see the organizations as inclusive community building platforms but they are also naturally exclusory in some ways. Users have been pretty tech savvy and, and understand cryptocurrency to participate in, or rather they have to be, to participate in DAOs. Plus they typically have to own tokens and potentially a significant amount to have a meaningful say in the DAO. The DAO landscape is rapidly evolving, however, as the new tools emerge and varying governance structures can take hold. For a walkie, those Gitcoin projects award grants and funding for Ethereum uh, ecosystem projects. He sees this kind of community coordination as an effort that can ultimately impact the world. We have a transparent, immutable, programmable coordination mechanism that is worldwide in jurisdiction, he explained. If we have the global coordination failures uh, around misinformation, climate change, or privacy violations, Really, there's a lot of coordination failures that the infrastructure that we inherited from the previous generation is no longer able to handle. Milwaukee cited Ethereum as a platform for solving such coordination failures, as Gitcoin has a particular focus around funding public goods, as seen with a recent Moonshot Bots in NFT initiative that has now raised more than 2.3 million worth of ETH such grant, uh, for such grants. He believes that an increasing focus with the Ethereum community toward public benefit development rather than DeFi or NFT initiatives will be a net positive for everyone. You hear Gitcoin talk a lot about funding public goods, which is one of the big coordinate failures of Ethereum, he said. DeFi is great and financing art is great, but what I really would love to see is us moving past a decentralized casino and into really having a positive impact for the world. And I think that is possibly Ethereum's legacy. Meta Dreamer and Iwaki further discussed the changing landscape around Web3 technology, including Iwaki, who seems uh, a need to better reward and cr uh, the creation and maintenance of open source tools. Both speakers suggest that blockchain-based communities, uh, community coordination efforts will ultimately disrupt existing businesses and communication structures. In MetaDreamer's view, however, it will be a gradual transition rather than a sudden one. Uh, for the use of tools that we're creating to our, help ourselves first, before we convert the whole world to use it, I think we really, uh, I think that's really how it's going to happen. So eventually, it's going to outcompete the legacy way of doing things, and people will eventually migrate over. It's not going to be this crazy thing like we're seeing with the teardown of the system. Even so, Awaki said that the emergency, the emergence of being able to transfer digital value and, and convey digital scarcity will be a hugely disruptive transformation that we're pretty much already seeing with NFTs. It could be a positive thing in this view, reinventing concepts like jobs and banking with in, uh, internet native coordination tools, but it could also turn negative if people don't choose to work together and focus on collective benefit. 
it could get pretty dark pretty quickly, Walkie said. Coordination is a choice, and we will all have to choose to coordinate or turn the battleship towards Utopia and away from Dystopia. I think that we will have to choose to show up and coordinate and be our best selves and build community first every day. I'm not going to go into this. He's very uh, platitudinous with his uh, uh, speaking, but I'm, I'm not going to say I disagree with the man. The Dow concept really is getting us away from you know, centralized organizations like mm -hmm. governments to give kind of a more universal ideal for um, active governance. You know, it's, not, it's not just one party's idea, although technically you do have to be a state or a token holder to be a part of the DAO, but the, the token holder uh, factor is more like the interest of the, of the blockchain and not so much the interest of what the X or Y government says. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yep. It's uh, community-based. I love it. I love it. That's why, that's why when the DAO came out in 2016... That's when I was one. It's part of my history. I was one hundred percent in into it all, and of course, what happened to the original DAO? Do you remember, Jake? Uh, which DAO was that? I don't remember. The original first DAO. The first DAO when it first came out on Ethereum was actually I don't want to say hacked. It was bad coding. It was bad coding from the get go. So when everybody it was the largest investment, uh, or should I say, ICO? It was an, it was an ICO, the largest ICO in, in Ethereum's history at that time during that year, 2016. when I when I was doing YouTube back then uh, in 2016, uh, I, I was recording the DAO's. Um, uh, I was live streaming the DAO uh, ticker and seeing how much money was being dumped into it. When I saw one million for the first time, because I mean, back then, one when you see one million in Ethereum, you're like, what? People are actually putting a million dollars into this DAO, and then you see two million, then you see ten million, and then you see fifty million. You're like, what? But now those numbers don't really compare to what the market is now. It just shows how much, in just a handful of years, how much the market has already matured. It's, it's a, it's like a whole different world now. It's it's so crazy to look back in 2016 to now. I mean, seriously. Can you imagine where we'll be in in just probably two years? I mean, the thing that that blows my mind is is, is even though we've seen Bitcoin hit sixty-four thousand dollars, I would not be surprised at this point. Hey, seeing you know, hundred thousand, even two hundred thousand, which sounds insane, but compared to where it was, not even a year ago, it doesn't seem that really that crazy. So right. I'm, yeah. I'm actually looking forward to when Ethereum breaks ten grand. So nice, nice. All right, next article written by Matthew DeSalvo. Franklin Templeton files for twenty million dollar blockchain venture fund. Asset manager Franklin Templeton said today in a fund that had raised $10 million for the blockchain venture fund, their firm, one of the world's largest asset managers, said Wednesday in a filing with the SEC that it was aiming to raise $20 million in total for its pooled venture capital fund, Franklin Templeton Blockchain Fund I. Or is that one? I. That's one. Yep. Yeah. One. one. LP. LP. It's likely the funds will invest in startups in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. No other details were provided about what the funds will be due in filing. Okay, that's it then. $20 million. There it is. Next article. <laughs> is that the uh, Coinbase takes first steps? Yep, take it. Alrighty. Coinbase, this is from Jess Benson. Coinbase takes first steps to tr start trading crypto futures. Ooh. Coinbase announced today, by the way, this is just an advertisement, <laughs> that it, filled, it has filled the, nation, the National Futures Association to be, pardon me, filed with the National Futures Association to become a registered futures commission merchant. This indicates the exchange is seeking to move move, pardon me, move beyond mere spot trading, which is just trading, you know, one coin for another, one asset for another, to a lucrative business of derivatives trading in which people can bet on future prices. Great, you know, betting. Uh, that's where they really make their money, honestly. Typical ter der pardon me. Typical derivatives, derivatives, say it right, Kate. <laughs> include futures and options contracts. <laughs> futures allow people to buy and sell contracts that establish the price of Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency on a specific date in the future. Think the price is going down, right? You can try to sell it for a higher price and pocket the difference. Options contracts work similarly, but allow traders the option to buy or... Uh-oh. We lost Jake. Uh, Jake, there you are. Are you back online? Oh, good. We lost you there for about. 
Yeah, go back to uh myself. <laughs> yeah, think think the price is going down. All right, let's see here. Um that go. Okay. Think the price is going down? You can try to sell it for a higher price or and pocket the difference. Options contract will work similarly but allow tra traders the option to buy or sell at a predetermined price. Popular contract of uh, perpetual contracts, futures that don't expire, are another popular iteration. In the U.S., any business seeking to sell, indivi sell to individuals must register with the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, the federal regulator of not just commodities but derivative products. But to do so, they must typically first be members of the NFA, which handles the registration process on the agency's behalf. Derivatives trading is big business in traditional financial markets and in cryptocurrency. Futures, vo futures volume on Binance dwarfs the volume on its standard exchange by a factor of three to one. The disparity is even larger on FTX, the global exchange that is making a large adv advertising push in the US where its smaller American affiliate is also seeking to offer derivatives trading. Coinbase has watched all these and other competitors, including largely unregulated Deribit, <laughs> sounds like a frog croaking, have uh, created a nearly $150 billion market for crypto derivatives, according to current data from CoinGecko. While it may be king of American spot exchanges, it is decided that it can't continue ceding exotic territory to its rivals. I think this is actually a probably good move for Coinbase in general, obviously not just from a standpoint of money, but it needs to catch up with Deribit, uh, or Deribit, whichever you want to call it. Right, but um, I think this is the reason why the SEC has actually put the ban hammer down on Coinbase and has been on their spotlight. Um, I think this is the actual issue right here. That's why it, it's been a, a while. I, this has been pretty much in the works for a good while, but hasn't came out. But yesterday the SEC finally had a word uh, publicly, they, there was a lot of public statements in regards to crypto, and a lot of um, um, council members. I'm not sure what you call them. Council members. They they went up and they spoke with the SEC and questioned them in regards to what their view is on on crypto. And there wasn't really any transparency. At all. Hopefully, later on in the, uh, in the news, there's an article down there somewhere about the SECs and their discussions of what happened yesterday, because it was a bunch of. Uh, it was baloney, if anything. It was it was garbage. It really was. It really was. It's. Yeah. I I hate when they do that. It's like, dude, just answer the question. Everybody was asking the same question. Like, okay, what is an asset? You know, what what is a commodity? Please, just define that, please. If you're in charge of that. But in regards to the CFTC, in regards to this news article, it does sound like the CF CFTC is going to be the heroine, in regards to. Uh, helping Coinbase get this going because this whole uh, I dare bit or uh, futures trading is uh, more of the CFTC and not the SEC but the SEC being the bully that they are they're trying to come in and say hey you're doing things illegally don't be doing it but I think oh, with the CFTC if they, if they can stand up and please stand up CFTC and, and defend Coinbase and other exchanges from just just let them do the things. Let them go within. They they want to be they want to be part of the standard. They want to have things organized. Please just put it out there. But the SEC just doesn't have anything. I don't understand it. Let's see if there's an article here later on about that. Right. All right. Let's see here. Next news. Brian Brooks. Not everything in crypto needs to be regulated. Written by Jeff Benson. Look at that guy. That's a good smile. I like that headshot. That's a good one. That's one of the best ones he has. Yeah. Crypto regulation yeah. is an inflection point in the U.S. as companies complain about the lack of clear guidelines. Lending exchange Coinbase last week fumed about it, uh, about a fight it's having with the Securities and Exchange Commission over a lending product it wants to launch. In the background, Ripple Labs is defending itself against a $1.3 billion SEC lawsuit over XRP token offerings. And major financial regulators are meeting behind closed doors to decide how to deal with stablecoins. Brian Brooks, a former top regulator himself and former Coinbase general counsel, suggests we're approaching it all wrong. Like we're asking the kids selling lemonade to the neighbor, neighbors to get a health permit. It's a weird question. Hey, you're doing something. Show me what regulation you're complying with. 
<laughs> Dude, that's perfect. I look. I like the way you said that. During during a panel on institutional, uh, absolutely. During a panel on institutional adoption of digital assets at the Salt Conference, a biannual event covering global finance and technology, the former former Binance U.S. CEO and acting comptroller of the currency referenced his own experience. Quote. I don't start with the regulation. I start with what is the activity that we're doing here and what aspects of it ought to be regulated, he told the audience. And I don't start with the assumption that everything that's happening in crypto land ought to be subject to banking or security re- securities regulation. To Brooks, regulations are about dealing with issues raised by people, but cryptocurrency and blockchain tech are about code. That, of course, is half true. There are people developing the code that goes into crypto products, just as there were people behind the ne- negligent policies that encourage Bank Bank of America employees to sign people up for accounts and services they did not ask for. But Brooks, a crypto progressive who took heat for expanding expanding his op- expanding opportunities for digital asset firms while at the OCC, was making a larger point uh, that this this in, what is that this in Disinter, disintermediation, disintermediation can remove the disintermediation. Disintermediation can remove the negligent and the fraud of the self dealing out of the equation. What's left to be regulated then are rules for comp- uh, compensating losses and instituting cybersecurity s- standards. Brent Tejpal, who uh, who heads up sales trading and custody for Coinbase, said it's forever been the case that a few brave companies would step up into the regulatory void. He cited his 25 years as an investment banker with the likes of Barclays and JP Morgan where he linked, linked institutional investors to emerging asset classes. During all those years, usually regulation follows innovation, he said, and there's and there's and so there wasn't a moment in time where it was crystal clear of what the regulatory backdrop was that enabled the capital to come. Now, his firm is facing stiff resistance from the SEC, which it says will sue it over its proposed LEND program, but won't explain why. Coinbase has, Ted Paul pointed out, traditionally gone out of its way to be on the right side of regulation, something Brooks established while serving as the exchange's general counsel. Brooks, who served as OCC head under President Trump, pinned some of the blame for overzealous restrictions on Democrats. He pointed to testimony by SEC Chairman Gary Gensler before the Senate Banking Committee yesterday claimed that Democrats believe that every activity that involves the value should be subject to security regulations. Other panelists generally shared his views that regulators and officials shouldn't dampen innovation. Glenn Barber, head of sales and business business development for crypto custody firm uh, Copper, said... We have an opportunity to either do something that's going to affect the future and maintain what could be a very significant competitive advantage in terms of financing and the way that we do things with technology, or we can lose it. Yeah. It's a, it's a, uh, I keep looking at this from the standpoint of uh, the, the whole point, I keep pointing back to uh, Milton Friedman, the, the you know the father of modern economics, I actually remembered his name this time, um, <clears throat> who kind of conce- you know conceptualized the idea of what Bitcoin is today, and yet he knew what this was going on, and he knew the financial industry. And this the interview I remember is he talked about this eCash thing that he came up with you know in in the mid 70s, 1970s, 50 years ago, and when he's saying you know, and it was a problem then. It's definitely a problem now, and that's why Bitcoin exists. That's why cryptocurrency exists. Um, we are trying to wrest the uh, control of this crap from, uh, I wouldn't say it's just a small number of people, but um, from those who think, they ha- who think they own it. They're like, well, this is, you know, this is our country, and we, we're in charge. And like, no, the people are in charge, not you. Everyone is. Everyone who has money, they have a play in this. But you seem to think, you know, the SEC or whomever, seems to think that they have to control everything. And at, at this point, I disagree. And so, you know, the people have spoken and created something to, like I said, wrest control from the powers that be. 
<clears throat> now, of course, the powers of be are still kind of pissed about that, and so they're trying to control it. But, mm -hmm. you know, it says that in, in, with respect to Monero, <laughs> you're not going to do it. Um, people are going to do what they want to do because they want to do it because they feel that they should have that right. It's not the point of it's like, um, I, I'm trying to get, I'm not trying to go on a rant again, but uh, the my issue with income tax, we really, and I know I, should, I keep saying it again and again and again, we should get rid of it, but it's it's like it if you're doing it if you're doing it honestly, if whatever you're doing is honest, and I realize there are plenty of people who are not doing it honestly. But if you're doing it honestly, you're not going to get in trouble. There's nothing to get in trouble for. You know, you're you're doing what you're what's being asked of you. So what what is wrong with what we're doing now? If you own co coin, then when you exercise it and turn it into fiat, you pay taxes. That's how it works right now. So what what is the problem with regulating this? Right? As soon as people start exercising this, now I I think that what they're worried about is that people are going to not exercise it and keep it in the crypto format. But at that point, someone's going to decide, you know, you can't just hold on to $100 million. And, and the U.S. currently says that if you don't, uh, was it, there's a penalty. Is it, is it $10 million or $100 million that you get penalized for? I, just I, I think it's 10 $10 million? Okay, so what? A, but the, I get the point. The point is they want people to do something with money and not just sit on it. But isn't that your right to sit on it? Mm -hmm. But the only thing, that, that, that I guess the point I'm trying to make here is, it's your right to do it, but there's no, no no real point in just having ten or a hundred million dollars if you're not doing anything with it. Why have it? You, you, you mean, you, to me, I, I, I can't even comprehend why you'd hold on to hundred million dollars if you had no purpose for it. Money is a tool, not just a you know a comfort. It is a comfort to some people, but um, I guess what I'm saying is, if you're not using it for anything. I'm not saying you shouldn't have it, but it's pretty stupid. So. Um, if the government, the government keeps making these rules and people are just trying to get around it, so it's, I, I, I agree with this, pers this perspective they're, they're putting out. The government doesn't need to get into this. They've already set rules and they work. Let's just go with that. But the government can't leave its sticky fingers. You know, Uncle Sam's got a heavy cut on yep. everything. So, anyways, sorry to rant. No, nope. go ahead, take it away. Right here, uh, the next. Uh, news article from Andrew Hayward. Solana sputters back to life following downtime network restart. Rising blockchains network Solana has had a roadblock Tuesday when the, the network shut down. We know how that is. But that happened with Dynamo. Mm. <laughs> Due to yeah. overwhelming transaction volumes. That was not the problem. Solana was ultimately offline for nearly 18 hours before validators were able to successfully restart the decentralized network. But coming back online and resuming block production isn't as simple as flicking a switch. DApps or decentralized apps, block explorers, and support systems will recover with the next within the next several hours, at which point full functionality will be restored. Could be restored. The official Solana status Twitter account tweeted at 2:01 a.m. Eastern. Shortly before then, an administrator in the official Solana Discord server wrote, "And we're back." <laughs> It's unclear whether full functionality has been restored at this time. SolScan shows transactions processed less than a minute ago as of this writing, but this but has displayed longer lag times over the past hour. Solana validators stopped producing blocks just before 8 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, and the network was a unable to process transactions until the network had restarted. Solana Foundation representatives did not immediately respond to Decrypt's request for further information about the network's restart process. In a statement yesterday, the Solana Foundation attributed the network outage to a flood of transactions that overwhelmed the network and that and said that engineers could not stabilize the network in time. That sounds like a you problem, or a they problem, excuse me. Solana mainnet beta encountered a large increase in transaction load, which peaked at 400,000 transactions per second, the statement read. These transactions flooded the transaction processing queue and lack of prioritization of network critical messaging caused the network to start forking. Fork you, network. <laughs> this forking <laughs> led to excessive mem memory consumption, causing the nodes to go offline. This sounds like a big problem, honestly. It's probably going to be tested again. Solana Lab CEO Anatoly 
Yakovenko tweeted yesterday that the transactions were sent to uh, Radium, a leading decentralized leading, pardon me, leading decentralized finance protocol on Solana. Radium was about to begin its IDO, or initial decentralized exchange offering, a type of token that is comparable to an initial coin offering. In this case, however, it takes place on a decentralized platform rather than a centralized exchange. The IDO in question was for Grape Protocol, a popular tool set for developers of DeFi apps, such as peer-to-peer -peer trading and lending platforms. Yakovenko added that Solana engineers had already started addressing the issues prior to yesterday's outage, but, the plan but that the planned software update had not yet been released. The price of Solana's native SOL, SOL cryptocurrency dropped during the outage day of $169 to a low of just above $145 per coin gecko. However, it has rebounded and the network has been restored functionality and the price is currently sitting out as of this writing, $163. Sol has been has seen a surge in value in recent weeks, rising from a price of around $35 at the start of August to an all-time high of $213 just last week. Mm. So this is knowing that this has happened, knowing that this can happen again, I am 100% certain, I'm going to predict it now, that this is going to happen again. Maybe not as seriously, but it could also be much more serious because if someone knows that they can, well, not just one person, but if a group of people know that they can bork a system, they will definitely try. I guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's exactly what happened. Yep. I mean, when you know about 51% attacks, you think you can pull it off, you will definitely try to pull it off. Are you? not really love. Here I go plugging, plugging Dynamo again. I really love Dynamo because the, the uh, designer basically made it so that it is not impossible, but nigh to unreasonable, well actually not nigh to, but perfectly unreasonable to not do it. There's really no reason to ever try to do a 51% attack, or in this case, 86% attack, uh, because you won't, you won't actually gain anything. You will actually only decrease the value of your coin if you try to do it. So. So, so here's the question. It's, it's highly, here's the um, question: Is Solana decentralized or centralized? Isn't it uh, more proof of stake than proof of work? Okay, so, yeah, I believe. I, I, it, I believe it is proof of stake. Right, and I believe that was the reason that. that I mean, obviously, not every network is going to be overwhelmed, but because Solana is, is gaining in popularity so quickly, it is a big target. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, um, if in, 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 I mean, we, we, we estimated what the total amount of Solana was recently. We were looking at this before the before the show, right? So yeah. Roughly um, half a billion, I think. Yeah. Half a billion coins. Half a billion coins. Uh, yeah. Total billion. value. Of, total value of Solana right now is fifty billion. Right. Almost fifty billion. Yep. So, could one person do it? Probably not. Well, Jeff Bezos could, but um, <laughs> he's not going to. Could one organization do it? Yeah, I probably could. I could definitely see an organization trying to do a 51% attack. Wouldn't that be crazy if some 14-year-olds can do it with their Raspberry Pi? <laughs> Jeez yeah. always, man. That's crazy. Let's All right. the next one. We yeah. got, we're only halfway through the news. Let's get to the next one. All right. NFT Marketplace OpenSea confirms executive, executive profited from insider tr info. Uh, written by... Oh, by the way, we, we are reading news from Decrypt. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. Uh, written by Andrew Hayward. Uh, OpenSea, the leading secondary marketplace for NFT collectibles and valued at over $1.5 billion, confirmed today that one of its executives used privileged information to profit from the sale of NFTs <clears throat> that were featured on its front page, a form of insider trading in effect. Yesterday, we learned that one of our top employees, excuse me, one of our employees <laughs> purchased items that they knew were set to display out in our front page before they appeared there publicly. The company wrote in a statement, This is incredibly disappointing. We want to be clear that this behavior does not represent our values as a team. Although OpenSea did not name the employee, the announcement comes following accusations on Twitter that Nate Chast Chastin, 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 the company's, Justine, Justine. Justine, Justine. the company's head of product used his position to purchase NFTs from lesser-known collections right before they were spotlighted on the marketplace's 
main landing page. According to information compiled by Twitter Twitter user Zuwu and RiceFarmer.eth, and corroborated by others, Chase 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 Steen, main Ethereum wallet, which is linked to the CryptoPunk NFT that he used as his Twitter avatar, is linked to the so-called burner wallets. These wallets were used to purchase numerous NFTs from projects like the Daily Dust Collection and Lurk Loves You. Oh, he got caught! Jeez, man. In each case, the, the affiliated wallets purchased NFTs from multiple collections right before each one was featured on OpenSea's homepage. Afterwards, the demand increased and the floor price rise, r- raised for each collection. Those NFTs were then resold for a profit. Ultimately, the profits in Ethereum were routed back into Chase, Chase Dean's main wallet. Well, there you go. He got caught. I just want to know if he's getting any charges on this. Let's see. Let me see. Do, 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 do. Scrolling on down. I don't see... There's got to be some sort of kind of charges against him, right? I would some think. Kind of backlash that not him for doing something. I'm talking. I'm talking l- legality wise, not just like, hey, you're gonna get suspended or you're gonna get fired, but you're actually gonna. Uh, remember, remember, uh, crypto isn't really regulated the way that uh, everything else is regulated. So he's probably not gonna get in trouble, at least from a legal standpoint. The only way he can get in trouble is from his own company. I mean, it's called insider trading, yes, but when you're not regulated by the SEC, then you're, it's not insider trading. I guess so. I guess you're it right. Is, it is effectively insider trading. Well, then, I I want to work for OpenSea, then. Please, hire me, OpenSea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're calling him out for it, which is good, but um, it says OpenSea is, re- is reviewing the situation before taking additional steps, according to its post. So... Um, yep. We shall see if he's punished publicly or just booted from the company, or you know. They better him fire him, dude. They better fire. I would. I would not trust really somebody like that, dude. Yeah. yeah Good. So because it, it's going to make OpenSea look bad, and they don't want that bad press. Mm-hmm. All right. Take the next one. Let's go to Liam Frost. Uh, next I like. One. I like that name, by the way. I've always liked that name. When I first heard, it, I'm like, that's a pretty cool name, man. My name's Liam. Liam Frost. You mean like Liam Neeson? <laughs> nah, that doesn't sound cool like Over, Frost. Okay. Over $1 billion, sounds like Dr. Evil, sorry. Over $1 billion worth of <laughs> Ethereum burn since London's hard fork. Fork you, London, fork you. Nearly 300,000 Ethereum worth over a billion dollars. Yikes. Dollars, sorry, can't, I should stop. At today's prices have been burned <laughs> since the launch of London's upgrade, also known as EIP-1559, in early August. According to Ethereum Metrics website, Watch the Burn, a great, great name, a total of 298,000 ETH has been taken out of circulation since August 5th. At the time of this writing, the number two cryptocurrency was trading at around $3,432 per coin gecko. So that's roughly 1.022 billion worth of tokens destroyed in less than six weeks. Man, someone's going through this cash fast. <laughs> at press time, Around five Ethereum worth just over $17,000 was being burned every minute. Currently, popular non-fungible tokens NFT marketplace OpenSea, which we just spoke about, is the biggest ETH burner among decentralized platforms. Since London's launch, it was responsible for burning just over 42,100 uh, 42, ETH, or $145 million, according to Ultrasound Money, dot money rather, in... At the same time, regular Ethereum transfers have resulted in the destruction of around 200, pardon me, 26,100 ETH, or $90 million so far. In its turn, decentralized crypto exchange Uniswap V2 burned 56.5 million. Another 50.5 million was burned on transfers of Tether stablecoins, 32 million on blockchain gaming platform Axie Infinity, and 30 million on Uniswap version 3. Ethereum London Upgrade has introduced several improvements to the blockchain. One of them is a mechanism that allows burning a large portion of transaction fees called the base fee instead of sending it to miners. You bastards! I'm a miner. According Mm. to uh, the proposals, this was done to counterbalance Ethereum inflation while giving back the block reward and priority fee, the maximum fee users are willing to spend, including their transaction in the block, to the miners. EIP-1559 
has also introduced a new mechanism that allows users to better estimate how much a transaction actually costs, while it didn't help lower gas fees, as some users were hoping. It helps crypto enthusiasts avoid overpaying for a transaction. So, as a crypto miner, big one, do run a fairly large uh, farm, not as big as some, but still pretty big. Um, it's a little disappointing, but it didn't really super change the amount of money. It just really changed the amount of money for people who are much, much larger farms. So big farms like 2,500 to 8,000, maybe 10,000 cards, they were concerned. My, my farm's nowhere near that big. Um, it is bigger than most people have in their homes, but um, it's it's not a, a, I did lose a little bit of profit, but not not as much as I was thinking. I was expecting a 40% drop and it was more like a 10 to 15% drop. Um, so, but at the same time, there are better coins out there. Just hinting. Jake, can you jump over to ETH gas station real quick and check how much the the uh, transaction fees are? Because I don't believe this. Don't look at my screen. I'm not you looking at your screen. I'm going to pop over. Okay, I see 90, 70, 70, 64. That's the top. No, just scroll down to like the... Right, highest tra cheapest transfer fee, $3.04. 40, 46 cents highest transfer 3417 okay Amazing. now look yeah look at my screen now okay. <laughs> yeah I was like wait what it's just, when, it's I, just when you showed it maybe you didn't maybe it didn't load properly man I was about to move all my all my dust right now I was like do it just move all the dust can't move any dust right now well yeah it Unfortunately, is. Donald exchanges have the ability to convert dust over. But Wait, hold on. I refreshed it again. What the heck? Is it just not working on mine? Maybe, you're, maybe, you're at, maybe you're, uh, Brave is blocking it. It's not blocking it for me. But yeah, it shows. Maybe refresh really quick and see if it pops up something different. Nope, so it's the same amount. Huh. Maybe I should transfer my dust. Finally! I'll do that after uh, the podcast. I'll transfer 35 bucks. That's not that bad, actually. The current the current levels that uh, Trader Fast and Standard are running at are actually pretty reasonable at the moment. Although the best was right after the previous, uh, not not the London, but the one was right before that. I can't remember what it's called. It happened in May. When that happened, the price the prices were so low that you could transfer you could do a fast transfer of less than five bucks. Nice. That's really good. Very nice. Yeah. All right. Hit that next one. All right. The, uh, Anchorage hopes to shake up big crypto. That's where we at. Written by Jeff John Roberts. Anchorage hopes to shake up big crypto trades with Dark Pool deal. Dark Pool? Is Dark Pool still around? When big traders want to buy a large amount of stock, they frequently turn to businesses known as alternate trading systems, ATSs, or as they're known on Wall Street, Dark Pools. Oh, I thought, okay, never mind. I was thinking of something else. Less regulated than public stock not, exchange. Not Deadpool, Dark Pool. No, well, yeah, yeah. There's there's a there's a there's a mining pool called Dark Pool. Uh, dark pools, but it's, I'm pretty sure it's long gone. Dark pools let investors conduct large trades without first sending a signal to the market that they're doing so. Now the crypto world is about to get a dark pool of its own. On Wednesday, the custody service Anchorage announced a strategic partnership with a firm called Oasis Pro Markets that bills itself as the first U.S. regulated ATS for crypto. The tie-up will see Anchorage provide on-chain on custody and settlements for Oasis, which offers, man, brave ads, which offers a crypto liquidity platform that matches buyers and sellers looking to carry out large trades discreetly. According to Anchorage's co-founder, uh, Diogo Monica, the arrangement will disrupt the current system for large trades, which are often arranged on an ad hoc basis on platforms like Telegram or through so-called over-the-counter desk. Middlemen who match up buyers and sellers. Wait a minute. I didn't know that. I thought OTC, well, I guess it would be P2P, right? Person to person or peer to peer? If I'm just, if, I, if I'm, okay, never mind. Okay, so I, I always thought it was OTC. Okay, never mind. Okay, cool. That's good clarification for me. I just learned something. The more you know. <laughs> While Oasis and Anchorage are also middlemen, the platform are uh, they are launching is automated. This is significant, Monica told Decrypt, because it resembles 
the sort of dark pools that institutional investors have long used to trade stocks and will likely lead to more large trades and greater overall liquidity in the crypto markets. Yes. Monica describes the platform as a crypto native trading system that will offer large trades of stable coins and a variety of other digital assets like Bitcoin. Anchorage's, ties, uh, Anchorage's tie up with Oasis to launch a crypto dark pool is one of several significant partnerships for the San Francisco startup. The company launched in 2017 as a new type of crypto custodian with an app based interface and has since attracted the likes of Visa and major banks as clients, while also offering services like lending and staking. In the last year, Anchorage uh, has uh, also signed a contract with the U.S. Marshal Services. Ooh and is on the cusp of signing one with the FDIC, the agency that backstops failing banks. The deals reflect how various governments' agencies are increasingly having to handle crypto as part of their operations. Earlier this year, Anchorage became the first crypto company to obtain a federal bank charter. All right, so who's going to be the first one to build a brick-and-mortar bank? Is it going to be Anchorage or Kraken? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I guess it's not a totally bad thing, but at the same time, it's like, um, uh, it's like defeating the purpose. Why would you make a physical bank for a decentralized concept? Yeah. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Some, some idiot's going to do it. I name Spawn of, G of Steve Jobs. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Take the um, next one. But yet. Yeah. Let's go on. Yeah, moving on instead of discussing that, maybe I should just cut my. Uh, well, this one's pretty short. Um, final, Bitmex executive accepts U.S. extradition to his report. Oh, they finally got him, huh? Way, way putting it, but Gregory Dyer, one of the four high-level executives of Four Horsemen, sorry, of Seychelles-based uh, crypto exchange Bitmex, who was charged with violating the Bank Secrecy Act (BSA) last October has agreed to be extradited to the U.S. from Bermuda, the Royal Gazette reported on Tuesday. On October 1st, 2020, federal prosecutors in New York accused four BitMEX executives, including the exchange's CEO Arthur Hayes, CTO Samuel Reed, co-founder Benjamin Delo, or Delo, and head of business operations Gregory Dwyer, of conspiracy to evade money laundering regulations. regulations. At the time, the U.S. Department argued uh, U.S. Justice Department argued that Hayes, Reed, Dalo, and Dwyer fully failed to establish, implement, and maintain an adequate AML, otherwise known as anti-money laundering program, including an adequate customer identification program, more commonly referred to as the KYC program, for BitMEX in violation of the BSA. As a result, its failure to implement AML and KYC programs, BitMEX made itself available as a vehicle for money laundering and sanctions violations, the indictment stated. Reed was arrested in Massachusetts on the same day. Delo, Delo <coughs> surrendered to authorities in March, and Hayes turned himself in on April 6th. All three were charged with one count of violating the BSA, one count of conspiracy to violate the act, and were later released on bail for $5 million, $20 million, and $10 million, respectively. Oof. Good thing they had that kind of money. Yeah. Each of these offenses can result in up to five years in prison. The trial has, begun, has been scheduled for March 28, 2022, by the U.S. District Court Judge John, uh, John George Kotel. Kotel? No. Coltet. I don't know. That <laughs> word. <laughs> in New York. <laughs> Uh, in April, while the U.S. was see seeking a his extradition, Dwyer's lawyers told Decrypt that they have been in touch with the government on Mr. Dwyer's behalf and have informed them of his whereabouts. They were also aware that he has every intention to defend himself in court against these meritless charges and is eager to do so, Dwyer's lawyer said in a statement. According to the World Gazette's report, Dwyer's uh, request to be extradited was filed by the magistrate's court in Bermuda and is currently awaiting approval by Governor Rena Lalji, magistrate. Oh boy, this one's tough. <laughs> magistrate Kam Kamisi Tokumbo. Tokumbo, yeah. Kamisi Tokumbo uh, reportedly extended Dwyer's twenty thousand dollar bail. All right, I'll I'll talk so, about this real quick. So uh, yeah. so if you don't know uh, Betbex, Bet. BitMEX was one of those exchanges. Actually, it was the exchange prior to Binance, one of the largest, if not the largest exchange, even surpassing Coinbase at the time, because this was before BitMEX was even even around. 
or sorry, uh, Binance was even around. BitMix was the place to go. And now, what they did, they were they established themselves outside of the U.S. Therefore, they were they didn't have to do uh, KYC or AML. I guess according to them, because you know, hey, we're we're out of we're out of U.S. sanctions. We don't need to worry about that. We're doing our own thing over here. Now, if American citizens want to use our exchange, that's up to them. Whatever, we don't care. But I guess there was a loophole, and they found something where I guess there was a lot of uh, activity going on with with uh, I guess Americans and money laundering. So he, that's why he was extradited. And that's why he was charged with that. And yeah, no, since I'm, then, it was I'm shut down. I'm aware of it. Bitmex was. Uh, I didn't really use it. The only reason I actually ever used Bitmex was to see the current state of Bitcoin and certain other coins. And I literally never actually traded there. Um, but it was. It was in the beginning. It was kind of like, well, this is nice. It's, it's gigantic exchange of thoughts and stuff going on here. But the other thing was, it always bugged me that a lot of less savory characters were pushing BitMEX. They're like, hey, come over to BitMEX. And it's mainly because in one of the exchanges I did use for a little while, Bit7, was um, uh, I realized there was plenty of AML, or not AML, but actual ML going on. I'm sure it was, you know, on the level of, uh, uh, what's it called, um, Silk Road. But the, the trouble is, a lot of people would advertise on YouTube or other, you know, sites like that sense saying, hey, trade on BitMEX, use my link, because they would get 15% off all trades made. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and so, I mean, was it sleazy? Yeah, of course it was. Um, but, I mean, it... How do I put it exactly? Uh, did they know there was money laundering? Did they know that things were... Yes, of course they knew. Um, did they try to block people? Yes, they tried to block people. Uh, and there was a time for quite some time, as I recall, when it wouldn't matter if you got a link from somebody trying to, you know, shill on BitMEX, you wouldn't be able to use it. Because unless you were using a VPN, you're not going to BitMEX. Right. This was also the same time, because, so, BitMEX was, was at the pinnacle when all this happened. This was um, almost prior to KYC AML. And when KYC and, a, uh, KYC and AML came through, they told BitMEX, hey, you're going to have to come out, you're going to have to meet those standards as well as every other exchange out there. And BitMEX is like, well, we'll do our part, but what uh, your stand? I, if, if I recall correctly, they didn't really meet up to the standards, and that's what back, back backfired on them. I mean, at the same time, they're in Bermuda, right? They're not mm -hmm. really, as I said, under the jurisdiction of, of Americans. But the fact remains, how many Americans were using this? Was it, you know, ninety percent Americans using BitMEX? Right. So I think all they did was just uh, they just turned off anyone's IP address that was within uh, within the states. And all the users had to do basically nobody. There was no drop in 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 in, in, in uh, li liquidity. Right. Li it yeah. still kept going. People just just literally turned on their VPN and just kept going. It's like so what? Exactly. Yep. That is exactly what happened. But uh, yeah, it's um, you know if people want to trade illegal, they're going to trade illegally. And it, yeah. of course, the government's going to try to stop that. But. You can't do that. Uncle Sam needs his money. Exactly. Again uh, with Big so Brother. Here is, uh, is it funds? funds okay, never. from Tim Huckey. Funds never at risk, says developer of Ethereum scaling solutions, uh, Arbitrum, during downtime. Uh, the sequencer feature of the popular Ethereum scaling solutions, Arbitrum 1, went down for approximately 45 minutes. Uh, yesterday, according to a report by the network's developers, Offchain Labs, Arbitrum tries to solve Ethereum's transactions bottleneck, which is capable of handling 14 transactions a second by using a transaction verification mechanism known as optimistic rollups. The uh, optimistic rollup solution involves moving the transactions verification process off the Ethereum blockchain and onto a side chain, which per per periodically settles transactions on the main blockchain to ease congestion and fees. Although Offchain Although Offchain says funds were never at risk, users were unable to submit new transactions during the outage. Offchain fixed the sequencer bug quickly, and the team posted its conclusion on the outage report. Quote, the root cause of the downtime was, downtime was a bug causing the sequencer to get stuck when it received a very large burst of transactions in a short period of time. The issue has been identified and fixed and has been deployed. Does this not sound familiar? Mm, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> these are just growing pains. This is like another, 
we're, we're turning a new chapter in crypto and there's just more and more users coming online, which is a, it's a beautiful thing. It's a good thing that we have more, more people coming online. But with that comes, obviously, we need more developers, more coders, and there's not enough of them. There's definitely not enough of them. But with growing pains, these issues are going to come up over and over again. Like you said, Jake, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. Yep. Yep. It is. All right. Take the next one. I will go to the next one. <clears throat> Our right conspiracist received $60,000 in Bitcoin to fund the legal case. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh boy, this will be fun. Oh yeah. Pro-Trump activist Douglas Mackey was arrested in Florida January 27th, 2021 for allegedly sp spreading misinformation, posting hate online, and conspir conspiring pardon me, to threaten or intimidate voters in the 2016 presidential election. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, he's now received $60,000 worth of Bitcoin, which would be what? <laughs> 1.2 Bitcoin? Uh, in an anonymous donation. According to the SPLC, a legal defense fund was created by his, quote, friends and supporters. The SPLC said that, quote, less than two days after the social media push began on the evening of March 11, 2021, an anonymous donor sent Mackey 1.026178 Bitcoin, worth at the time $58,600. Donors have sent around 63,450 in total to the address on uh, Mackey's legal fund defense. They asked, added, This is not the first time the flagship cryptocurrency has been embroiled in fundraising schemes for the far right conspiracists. The promotional blitz around Mackey's legal fundraiser attracted donors with apparent ties to multiple wings of the far right. The S SPLC also found that one Bitcoin donor, that the one Bitcoin donor sent money to addresses that were associated with the National Alliance, a white supremacist and neo-Nazi political group founded in 1974. The SPLC analysis found that the donor has sent approximately $190 worth of Bitcoin to the National Alliance on January 4th, two, prior, two days prior to Capitol Hill riots. Bitcoin wasn't just sent to far-right conspiracists during the Capitol Hill riots in 2021. It was partly funded, uh, partly funded, funded the riots themselves. According hmm. to data analysis from Chainalysis, a donor sent roughly half a million dollars worth of Bitcoin in to 22 separate addresses, mm -hmm. many of which belong to far-right activists and internet personalities that were present during the riots. The, fir the firm claimed that the funds came from a deceased a deceased computer programmer in France who left a suicide note to explain his actions. I care about what happens after my death. That's why I've decided to leave my modest wealth to certain causes and people, the note read. <laughs> uh, that doesn't sounds, really make... I don't know why that sounds so funny, but it honestly sounds yeah, completely made it, it up. Does, um, yeah, exactly. It but, sounds uh, a heck of made up. It doesn't sound legitimate at all. I mean, you're having a French... Maybe an American in France. I don't know, but... If you're telling me a Frenchman is over here Completely supporting complete. white supremacist, I mean, okay, let's let's just wave that. Whatever, dude. It, it yeah. is if it is what it is. But I'm kind of curious: is the one Bitcoiner donor is if he's if he or she are they ever caught? Would they be uh, like charged with conspiracy to commit terrorism? Like, are, would there be charges against them? Uh -oh. Not sure. Maybe it's possible. If mm. somebody wants to press charges, it, it may be possible to do that. But I mean, just because this guy, if somebody, anybody can donate to it, to another person's you know legal case if they want to. Um, but uh, it, it does draw into question the motive, right? Mm -hmm. Like, well, why did you do it? Yeah. You know, are you doing this because you really like this guy? You, you must. Who else would donate one? I mean, it's only one bitcoin. But I mean, who else would donate one bitcoin? Unless they're just like, yeah, what the hell? I don't need a Bitcoin. Here you go, sixty grand. Um, I've got hundred. Oh, oh. <laughs> mm, okay, I don't know. That's a, that's a shady one, man. I, I don't know. It's it's a weird one. It is. Let's hit Bitwise with the files for Bitcoin features. Got it. Yep, we were talking. Written about. by Andrew S. Smokov. Bitwise files for, for Bitcoin futures ETF. 
Crypto Asset Manager Bitwise is seeking to launch an exchange traded fund tied to cash settled Bitcoin futures contracts, adding its name to a growing list of hopefuls for this type of investment vehicle. ETFs are investment products that track the price of an asset or group of assets and trade like stocks or, or on, on an actual exchange. ETFs Series Solutions teamed up with Bitwise Index Services, a division of the asset management firm, to file an application for Bitcoin futures ETF with the Securities and Exchange Commission on Tuesday, September 14th. Yeah, good luck getting approved. If approved, Bitwise Bitcoin Strategy ETF will not invest in Bitcoin directly. Instead, the fund seeks to obtain exposure to Bitcoin primarily through indirect investments in standardized cash-settled Bitcoin future contracts traded on commodity exchange registered with the CFTC. According to the filing, the fund may also invest in other financial products such as pooled investment vehicles and Canadian-listed funds that provide exposure to Bitcoin. Now, the reason they say Canadian listed funds uh, exposed to Bitcoin because Canadians, the Canadians did actually approve um, having having this go through. So they have it, we don't. Uh, let's see, Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, I guess that's what they have, right? Bitcoin, B- Bitcoin, uh, bleh, Bitcoin ETFs tied to the world's largest cryptocurrency have long been on Americans' investors' wish list. Yet the SEC is yet to approve such a product as an excuse to repeatedly deny or delay decisions or make frust- uh, frustrated applicants withdraw the agency's sites, Bitcoin's volatility, and market manipulation risk. Currently, there are more than 10 firms queen, uh, queuing, queuing up for the SEC to approve their applications, including the likes of Vanek, Fidelity, and Skybridge. However, their, hope, their hopes for an ETF backed by physical Bitcoin seems to be withering as the agency's chair, Gary Gensler, let me say that again, Gary Gensler. I'll say it again, Gary Gensler. Don't forget his name, all right? Gary Gensler hinted last month that he'd be more inclined to see an ETF tied to Bitcoin features. Mm-hmm. While Gensler's remarks prompted several firms, including Invesco, Vanek, uh, Valkyrie Investments, Galaxy Digital, and Advisor Shares, to apply for Bitcoin futures ETF, the hunger for spot Bitcoin ETFs remains. Quote, people don't want Bitcoin future exposures. They want physical Bitcoin exposures. Bloomberg ETF research analyst James, uh, ooh, say, say fart. <laughs> I can't say, how do you say that? <laughs> say, say, fart, say, 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 fart, say, fart, say, 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 this desire is also reflected in Bitwise's uh, latest application, as it mentions the possibility of investing in Canadian Bitcoin ETFs. Okay, there you go. See, they just mentioned it. Canada is one of the countries. There it is. Canada is one of the countries where investors have already exposed exposure to the benchmark cryptocurrencies through ETFs tied to physical Bitcoin, with purpose Bitcoin ETFs, evolved uh, evolved Bitcoin ETFs, and CI Galaxy all trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Beautiful Canada. I'm moving to Canada. <laughs> All right. Here's the spot. Here's the last one from Liam, from another Liam, different Liam, not Liam Frost, but Liam J. Kelly. Just to be distinct, top DeFi tokens Curve, Ave, and Sushi Swap post double digit gains. Woo! Nice. Several tokens behind top decentralized finance DeFi protocols have gains of more than 10% over the last day, including the top case gainers are. Curve, Ave, and Sushi Swap. DeFi is a fast-growing sector of, crypto- of the cryptocurrency industry that offers many traditional finance services like lending and borrowing, but removes centralized in- intermediaries like banks and brokers. DeFi Llama, a dashboard that shows the total value locked across the entire sector, shows that there are a total of roughly $182 billion at press time, unlike DeFi Pulse, DeFi Llama doesn't confine itself to recording DeFi activity on Ethereum. Of this sector, three protocols and their native governance tokens stand out through Curve, Ave, and SushiSwap. All st- uh, share strong gains, and the reason behind these gains are varied. Curve, a decentralized exchange, or DEX, that optimized for like valued assets such as stablecoins, has launched an, on an Arbitrum layer 2 scaling solution for Ethereum instead of settling individual trades on Ethereum's mainnet. Or rather, instead of settling individual trades on Ethereum's mainnet, Curve operations are batched and periodically settled, thus reducing congestion and the cost of transacting to boost 
usage of Curve's initiative, the developer team has rolled out two liquidity pools, doling out high yields. The first, called TriCrypto, offers a whopping 272% for the users who added one of three assets, Tether, Wrapped Bitcoin, or Wrapped Ethereum. The second pool is called TwoPool and offers 6.5% yield for those for users that deposit either USD coin or Tether. There's also a vote today within Curve Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAO, to determine whether additional bonus tokens will be given to users who join either pool. If passed, additional CRV tokens, Curve's native governance token, would be given to the top of the base yield on Curve. These developments have likely contributed to the 18% rise of Curve over the past 24 hours. SushiSwap, a popular decentralized exchange, otherwise known as DEX, that allows users to trade, lend, and borrow, has also joined Arbitrum. In fact, it's one of the most richly integrated projects in DeFi with operations on Avalanche, Celo, Polygon, Phantom, Binance Smart Chain, as well as many others. The 15% spike in SushiSwap's native token, however, is likely attributed to the recent NFT sale on its token launching platform, MISO. Dubbed JPEG's Automark, interested uh, NFT speculators can purchase a DONA or DONA reservation token on MISO. The tokens can then be used to redeem a <laughs> 2007 Kia Sedona NFT on September 21st, 2021. And there are a couple of tweets that I'm not reading. Uh, if you're watching, you can see this. The sale of Donut token has already risen 427.14 Ethereum, which is 1.541 million dollars at today's prices. As for Aave, the crypto lending and borrowing platform, social media, and platforms newsletter have been buzzing with news of the soon-to-be-launched project. It is currently referred to as <coughs> Redacted Protocol by the Ave team. Hmm. Ave's co-founders and team members have hinted at the project with, uh, will relate to monetizing user social media activity. This sounds familiar. In July, Stan, Stani uh, Kul Kulichov, the founder and CEO of Ave, told Decrypt about, uh, about similar plans, adding that we believe that content creators should own, should own their audiences in a permissionless fashion where anyone can build new user experiences by using on-chain social graph and data. Aside from the mounting hype around this project, FRAX, F-R-A-X, an algorithmic stablecoin, has been added to Aave, letting holders borrow and lend the asset. These events may have contributed to Aave's native token, A-A-V-E, increasing by more than 15%. There were a lot of charts and graphs and tweets in that. If you were not watching, I'm sorry you missed it all. Just but go to our YouTube channel and watch it. Quite, yes, quite a bit of, um, of information coming from these different DeFi projects um, with a lot of functionality being added. And that's kind of the, the point here is that uh, it's not just money changing hands. It's money doing things. The literal purpose of money, as I probably mentioned like 10 times in this podcast. So. You said it's a tool. That is, that is about it. I think we're what? We're, we're, we're in an hour now? Yeah, now we're in uh, 13 minutes on the dot. Yeah, cool. Very it's, long. Very yeah, long it was good. There's a lot of information today. That was great. I love crypto news. All right, crypto nuts. Thank you, Jake. And thank you, Mike. Where, where's he at? Oh, he's not here today. That's okay. He'll be on Sunday. Do not forget crypto nuts. Mike will be hosting the Crypto Chill and Chat episode number two this coming Sunday around, what, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. 3 p.m. Right. Pacific. Yep. And don't forget, uh, crypt uh, Cryptocurrency Chat, we do that every Sunday and Wednesday, all right? You can check us out on YouTube, Discord, or even on any, pretty much any uh, podcast platform that you listen to. So with that said, Cryptonauts, thank you for listening. Until next time. Stack sets and huddle. Adios. Adios. I almost forgot that actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Wrapping it up. Three, two, one. Adios. <laughs>